Coming up on the FSR Sark Fighter podcast, a case of cardiac sarcoidosis. Because my heart rate was so low at night um, that they were really worried that that it, my heart would stop. Andy Locker is a systems engineer who may one day actually help you take a ride in an automated drone. But while he looks to our future, he is fighting sarcoidosis, as I said, in his heart and also his lungs. One day I got up and uh, it didn't dissipate. It was getting worse. And I'm like, I, 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 should, get, I should go sit down. And I was heading to, to sit down and I, I collapsed. It's all coming up on the award-winning FSR Sark Fighter Podcast. This is the Sark Fighter Podcast, living with sarcoidosis and other rare diseases. Here's your host, John Carlin. Hello and welcome to episode 101 of the FSR Sark Fighter podcast. I'm your host, John Carlin. It is Thanksgiving week of 2023. I can't believe it. The year has flown by and I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. Uh, if you're traveling and, you know, I work in TV news and we've been doing all the stories about this is the year, all the record numbers on the highways, in the air, um, and if you are traveling, I hope you're not stuck in traffic. But it occurs to me that I listen to a lot of my podcasts uh, while I'm in the car. So maybe you're in the car right now listening. If you are, I hope you're traveling well. Maybe you're uh, on a flight or you're in the airport waiting for one. And it, it also occurs to me that maybe you just, uh, maybe you're visiting relatives and you are sneaking away just to listen to something. <laughs> so uh, doing something uh, something to just get away from all the people sitting on the couch and watching football. I don't know. Uh, but uh, no matter what it is, I hope you're having a great Thanksgiving. And uh, we're looking forward to one here. Uh, and let's, let's hope that sarcoidosis doesn't mess things up too much for you. Uh, I can tell you I'll be, I'll be eating as normal this year. Uh, probably eat too much. Then go find a quiet place and, and nap for 20 minutes or so. Get, get in and out of my food coma. Uh, but then, uh, so after Thanksgiving, we are taking the grandchildren to a kid's resort outside Williamsburg. I think it's called the Great Wolf Lodge um, outside Williamsburg, Virginia for the three days after Thanksgiving. So uh, now we'll see how that goes. This is gonna, it's going to be uh, a lot of cars. Uh, it's about a five hour drive for us, four to five hours uh, if there's not any traffic. But I'm so grateful for all those grandchildren, of course, that this hopefully will, will go well. Although a bunch of us have the sniffles um, a couple of the grandkids have tested positive for COVID. There should be time for that to time out so that if the rest of the family doesn't get it, uh, then we can all go and be together. Um, we, I'm just kind of taking it one day at a time right now. But it, it really is a, a time of year to be thankful. Um, I, I, so I'll just share a couple of things because that, that's what you're supposed to do this time of year. But uh, sarcoidosis wise, you know, I think that right now I, uh, have been either controlled or in remission for a number of years. Uh, again, I can't do everything that I used to, and I still feel twinges here and there, um, related to sarcoidosis. I still take my medication regularly, daily, uh, in some cases, but for instance, we have a turkey trot here in Roanoke. It's called the Drumstick Dash, and it supports uh, the homeless shelter here in town, the the, the mission. Uh, and I, over ten thousand people run in this thing. It's it's the biggest quote unquote race that we have in Roanoke every year. And for years and years, I would run it, and I would try to see what kind of a time I could get. And you know, back when I was running regularly, I could I could run this and. 22 minutes, and I felt pretty good about that. That's not my 5K PR. Uh, I was under 20 minutes for that years and years and years ago. But but you know, but now uh, I don't run well anymore because of sarcoidosis. My legs don't function 
the way they should, but I will be perfectly happy pushing a stroller with some grandkids in it. That'll be fine. And I'll be there. I'll be participating. And probably instead of focusing on me and my time, focusing on the grandkids is uh, a better way to, to find happiness. So, uh, but that's, that's certainly something that, that I'm thankful for, that I've, I've kind of come full circle. Uh, I, I, not only do I accept it, but I relish it. Uh, and so that's good. I would say the same thing with, you know, you, t- you hear me talk about riding my bike a lot and my guest today, Andy, will be talking about riding his bike. Uh, but the fact is, is that even though I don't run, I still ride and I was out. We've had a nice late summerish fall here, the temperatures in the 60s. And I was out riding my mountain bike yesterday and still able to ride over some roots and rocks and some pretty technical stuff. And, you know, and just and just really enjoying that. And, and, I'm, and I'm thankful for it. All right. And of course, I'm, I mentioned my grandkids, but, you know, my sons and daughters in law and my wife, Mary, uh, you know, it's just uh, I've been I've been extremely fortunate. And I have to recognize that. And speaking of that, you know, my mom and dad are both in their late 80s. They're both still with us and living on our family hobby farm, 50 acres up in central New York, outside Utica, if that means anything to anybody. And I talk to them quite often. My mom's health is coming and going, but she's she's still sharp as a tack, and 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 so um, and and I'll be hopefully going up to visit them over the Christmas holidays. And I've got to mention my two dogs. You hear me mention Dougal all the time because he's very active. And as I as I speak, he is curled up on the chair in my office. And then we have a little terrier mix named Pippa. I don't talk about her as much. She's an older dog and just kind of. Kind of sits by herself a lot, but she still has a feisty sort of terrier personality, and and uh, and I love them both dearly. All right, I hope you are uh, enjoying the podcast. Before we get to my interview with Andy today, which I think you're going to like, just want to ask you to help me reach more people so FSR can be as effective as possible, and it just helps me grow the show if you'll share it on your social media or just tell one person about it. Okay, really appreciate that. All right, my interview with Andy Locker is going to resonate with you if you have sarcoidosis. He reached out to me via email, uh, and this came after my conversation with Tony Haskell over the summer. Tony's also a SARC patient, and Andy wrote, I'm writing to you today to let you know how much I've enjoyed your podcast. Thank you. Uh, I discovered it about three months ago, and I've been listening since. I find your style engaging and the topics informing, inspiring, and reassuring. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. That's that's why I do this. Uh, But he continues, uh, having a rare disease that few have heard of can be very isolating, and you're humanizing the disease with personal stories, your own included, helps normalize the disease and offers a sense of connection. And he writes, I just listened to your interview with Tony Haskell, who seems to have had some of the similar experiences as I have had. And then he continued later in his email. He said, my bingo card of specialists. I like that bingo card. My bingo card of specialists includes two cardiologists, an electrophysiologist, a pulmonologist, ophthalmologist, endocrinologist, rheumatologist, neurologist, ENT, and soon a gastroenterologist. And I have had countless scans and one biopsy, and then he puts in parentheses in his lungs. Uh, I have continued to have issues with balance, lightheadedness, and tinnitus, or tinnitus, which is that ringing in your ears. He says, but I consider myself fortunate. He says, I continue to read and learn about my disease, and given my technical background and interests, my doctors share academic papers with me. By the way, I would certainly be interested in participating in future sarcoidosis-themed bike rides. Thanks again for humanizing the disease and reducing the isolation feelings by offering a connection. Well, Andy, thank you so much for that email. Of course, I reached back out to Andy and we had a much more in-depth conversation. And that's coming up next here on the FSR Sark Fighter podcast. I feel like a zombie 
Hi, I hope you're enjoying the Sark Fighter Podcast. You may be wondering, what can I do to help? How can I be a part of the sarcoidosis solution? It's simple. Make a donation to KISS. Kick in to stop sarcoidosis. 100% of the money goes to the Foundation Welcome for back Sarcoidosis to the SSR, Research. Sark Fighter Podcast. Look for a link in the show notes of the Sark Fighter Podcast. Thank you very much, John. Yeah. So you were diagnosed, what, a little over two years ago? Uh, well, my my saga started a little over two two years ago. I actually was diagnosed about a year and a half ago uh, half. with sarcoidosis. So, so, um, so it, you knew something was wrong and then it took a while to figure out what it is. Welcome, welcome to sarcoidosis, right? I, and from what I understand, a year is pretty quick it is. to um, uh, to finding out what's what's causing the problems that you're having. And I, I feel, to be quite frank, fortunate in that it only took a year for it to be figured out. So how did you know something was wrong? Well, um, I, I'm a kind of analytic data kind of guy, and I love data. And I do some exercise activities, and I collect data while I'm exercising. Um, you know, I exercise for data, uh, one could say. And my wife is similar in that respect. And we were on a bike ride. And um, when we come to a stoplight, our tradition is we call out our heart rates. And, um, you know, and this started when we used to ride a tandem together. Um, okay. And that was a way to tell, you know, who's working harder because um, speed doesn't matter because you're together. Right. The only thing that really matters is heart rate. And my heart rate was usually tracks pretty well with my wife and mine was 30 beats per minute higher than hers. Uh, okay. That seemed odd. And I said, Oh, it must be an instrumentation problem. And, you know, we pull up to the next stoplight, same thing. And my heart rate is way higher than it normally is. It's just through the roof. And the and exertion I, is the same as it always was, but the heart rate is higher. Right. Higher, higher, right. like, right. like record setting high. Wow. Um, uh, for me, and um, I, I think it was in it ended up getting over 200 beats mm -hmm. per minute. Um, and and so I knew something's not right. And when we stopped, and you know, I put my watch back on, um, and I take my heart rate, and um, it's still in the 130s. And so I knew something wasn't right, and um, uh, I ended up going to the emergency room. And was um, diagnosed with atrial flutter. And, um, you know, sudden onset atrial flutter just seems weird. But um, I ended up having an ablation to uh, treat the flutter. The first ablation didn't take. So I had a second ablation to treat the flutter. And I thought it was just, you know, I'm having a heart problem. And but I continued. I had really no other symptoms except an occasional um, chest tightness. Other than that, I wouldn't have known I had atrial flutter other than the fact that I, I had, you know, collecting data through a heart rate monitor for, right. for exercise. And so um, the uh, chest tightness continued and my cardiologist ordered more tests because he was concerned that maybe there was some other underlying heart issue. And ultimately, through some of the other tests they were doing, they saw uh, uh, Lazen lesions on my lungs that gave them concern. So that prompted some lung tests and then um, some other scans, which they said, you know, you either have one or two things. You either have lympho uh, 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 a lymphoma or scar sarcoidosis. And they did a biopsy to determine which, uh, bronchoscopy, um, where they actually sampled the, the tissue in my lungs. Right. And they diagnosed me with um, a pulmonary sarcoidosis. Uh, at the same time, I was continuing to have, you know, arrhythmias, even though the uh, atrial flutter was solved through an ablation, I had other arrhythmias occasionally. And it just so happened that a cardiac sarcoidosis specialist was starting to see patients in the same office as my cardiologist was seeing patients. Hmm. And um, 
they said, you should go see this cardiac sarcoidosis doctor. And he says, yeah, it could be sarcoidosis in your, your heart as well. They ordered other tests. Um, you know, by, the, by this point, you know, since I had pulmonary sarcoidosis, I started on prednisone as the, you know, treatment of, of first choice. Apparently. First line of defense. Yep. Right. And so I was already on prednisone and I was, you know, starting to see a, a cardiac sarcoidosis a doctor. And it appears that the prednisone was working because when they did the uh, cardiac MRI and the uh, CAT scans, the three or four months in between pulmonary sarcoidosis diagnosis and these scans, uh, I didn't uh, show a positive indication of cardiac sarcoidosis, which was good news. Because the prednisone was working. But apparently. Everywhere, um, they, in your, everywhere in your body. Right. And so they started me um, uh, as a, uh, a tapering off of the prednisone and arrhythmias returned uh, back and um, uh, more serious arrhythmias uh, to the point where my doctor actually called me in, you know, when they had me on a halter monitor mm -hmm. and um, when the halter monitor was returned after two weeks and they were alarmed because my heart rate was so low at night um, that they were really worried that, that it, my heart would stop um, right. and I'd have a sudden cardiac death. And they recommended a pacemaker and an ICD. And um, within a week I had the pacemaker uh, an ICD installed and I, you know, it, 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 luckily I have not been um, shocked yet by the ICD, uh, but the pacemaker is, I am still rather dependent on the pacemaker uh, for, you know, otherwise my, my heart rate would be in the fifties or, or below as a resting heart rate, uh, which yep. is uh, of concern to them. Uh, well, what I would, what would have... your resting heart rate be? I mean, pre-sarcoidosis, when you're doing your bike rides and you were fit and everything, what was your just, you know, sitting sitting down watching TV resting heart rate? It, it was in the mid-50s, yeah. um, upper 50s. But, I, you know, I was seeing heart rates in the 40s. Right. Um, and um, there was one point where it was in the 30s um, when I was wearing the halter monitor. And mm -hmm. so they, they were they were concerned. I, I, and I am grateful for a a attentive uh you know uh competent team of doctors um i have quite the um bingo card full of different kinds of specialists um because you know in addition to um being in my heart and my lungs um the, the latest is uh, i just actually found out this morning it appears to be in my spleen as well um and um i have other symptoms which are unexplained uh, from the uh, sarcoidosis, what we think from the sarcoidosis, I have um, lightheadedness and uh, dizziness uh, on a regular basis, and I have balance problems. Uh, and it, this occurs when I have been sitting for a while and I stand, and I have actually um, passed out um, uh, and was injured um, in, in passing out um, uh, on that one occasion. So it's so something I'm trying to avoid. Tell me about it. You stand up and you're lightheaded and that's when you pass out. Is that what happens? Yeah. What, what What's happening is I, I stand, if I'm sitting for a little while, so mm -hmm. uh, let's say, you know, sitting doing a podcast interview uh, and then I stand up to, to go get uh, a, another cup of coffee, I may feel lightheaded upon standing for, for you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds. Right. It's getting a little bit better, um, but... Um, it was it was pretty bad. At the same time, I also get a throbbing in my ears, um, oh. and um, uh, sound is is going in and out. And this is something I didn't have before. This is something that started um, after I got the pacemaker, to be quite frank. And it, you know, it was getting pretty bad. I, I was doing what I call powering through. I'd feel dizzy, but and my ears are throbbing and. You know, if there's any white noise, you know, the sound is going in and out. And then, you know, after 30 seconds to a minute, it dissipates. Well, one day I got up and uh, it didn't dissipate. It was getting worse. And I'm like, I, I, I should get I should go sit down. And I was heading to to sit down and I, I collapsed. And um, 
Mm. Uh, pretty severely injured one of my legs uh, in the process of collapsing. I was lucky I didn't hit my head. Uh, that's just, I, just because of the way you fell, like you fell on your leg awkwardly or something like that? I, I guess so. Um, yeah. You know, I was not exactly paying attention to what was happening when I, because I was unconscious when I fell, but somehow I injured my leg, I, either twisting or, or banging, probably some sort of twisting action. Um, I was on L because of my uh, arrhythmias and my atrial uh, fibrillation. I'm on Eliquis, so the bruising is pretty well, a blood significant, thinner, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it's a blood thinner, and right. so it was. It looked pretty ugly too uh, after a couple of days, but it was rather painful. I had to walk with a cane uh, for for a couple of weeks, yeah. and you know, and 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 I recovered, and I'm getting better at managing the dizziness. Uh, but it still it still happens, and the the ear throbbing still happens on a a regular basis, and I have a little bit of tinnitus as well. I've had an MRI. Um, uh, a uh, brain MRI and an ear canal MRI. I got the results of the ear canal MRI and that looks clear. Um, uh, the uh, brain MRI, I didn't see the results yet. So. so, wow. So, so, you know, you've got to confirm that you have cardiac SARC and pulmonary SARC and you, and, and now in your spleen, you just found that out this morning. Um uh, how, how do they know to look on your spleen? What are the symptoms associated with that? Well, it, they weren't looking at my spleen. They were oh. looking at, they, they did my, you know, uh, periodic uh, CAT scan um, to see, you know, how the disease is spreading in, you know, and, and where it is in my heart. And uh, they just, you know, it's a, a scan from your, you know, basically your chin to your thigh. Uh, and they picked up activity not only in my spleen, but in my colon as well. So uh, the, the the report said that it, or at least my doctor told me that the um, radiologist says what, what he's seen from the spleen seems consistent with uh, sarcoidosis in the spleen. So it's it, it's not a, you know, a, I, my understanding, and uh, I'm no expert, but my understanding is the only way to really confirm a sarcoidosis diagnosis is through a biopsy. Yeah. It's, it's, it can see it, the, uh, observation is consistent with what would be sarcoidosis same thing with cardiac sarcoidosis i haven't had a biopsy on my heart this is you know the symptoms and behaviors are consistent with cardiac sarcoidosis so it's our well i think what they call a probable diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis hmm. okay so are you still taking prednisone or or anything uh, I, just just for sarcoidosis i am um uh, the prednisone, uh, the tapering of the prednisone hasn't gone well because um, uh, my adrenal gland has stopped producing the cortisol. And so um, I'm doing a very slow taper and I've uh, do using a, a steroid sparing uh, therapy uh, and my doctor is uh, prescribing mexotrexate for that. Mm -hmm. And um, they're pretty pleased with how um well first of all i'm tolerating mexotrexate fine and good, um good and, and so that seems to be going well and like i said I, I really feel like i have a good team um one of the things that i've started to do is um try to keep all of my doctors in the same you know uh, uh system if you will yeah and uh, you know i live outside of washington dc and um you know, I'm very fortunate that uh, we have a hospital center in, in Washington, D.C. that that has uh, experts in sarcoidosis, specifically cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh -huh. And so which, all which hospital doctors, is that? Which uh, hospital? The MedStar uh, hospital system. OK. okay. You know, and th there's another uh, kind of center of expertise at John Hopkins University. Johns Hopkins. Um, yeah, that's exactly. Um, yeah. And and many of the doctors at, at MedStar um, uh, studied at John Hopkins. Okay. And so uh, I'm I'm fortunate that, you know, I have a, you know, I live outside of a large city and, you know, it's, it's an hour to get down to the hospital, but uh, at least it's only an hour away. Okay. And I, um, I'm trying to keep most of my specialists in the MedStar system. And like I said, my, my bingo card of specialists, you know, between rheumatologists and pulmonologists, and uh, I have uh, endocrinologists, uh, ear, nose, and throat. Um, you know, it, it, 
it seems like I have just about everything uh, specialist neurologist as well because uh, right. they're looking about what's what's causing my dizziness. Yeah, so that that neurosarc would be, I would think would be it, unless it has something to do with the tinnitus because your ear is what maintains your balance. But right, you know, who knows? Who knows? It's uh, and sarcoidosis is just so mysterious, which is one of the the frustrating things about it. So you you had mentioned when you first contacted me that you were you liked the podcast because you were able to listen to other people and feel a little less isolated because if you're like most people, you don't know anybody else with sarcoidosis. Is number one, is that true? And uh, number two, how how has um how has it helped to find other people with sarc? Well, you're you're a hundred percent right. Um, I I do feel like I know one person who has sarcoidosis. You, um, <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, I there's not a lot of people uh, around with sarcoidosis. Um, there is a support group. Um, my, the the clinic I go to. Um, uh, through the uh, FSR, uh, they actually have a support group that they're mm -hmm. running, um, uh, and it is they're doing the support group in person. Uh, it's not super well attended, uh, but it's a, another opportunity to meet and talk to others who who share the disease. And actually, to be quite frank, listening to your podcast was a way that I felt connected to. You know, I'm I'm not alone. There there are other people. You know. Yeah, and listening even in the, the support group, I'm listening to other people's stories and I'm like, wow, they have it much worse than me. You know, that I, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I'm having it easy, but there are others who have suffered way more. There are others who've taken, you know, you know, multiple years. So one woman I heard from, it took over a decade before she was diagnosed with sarcoidosis mm -hmm. and that she was having symptoms. Um, and so, you know, I feel grateful when I hear these stories and it, 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 it's uplifting too, to hear how others have dealt with adversary adversity and persevered and are able to, you know, you, you're a good example. You you're continuing in your career and, you know, your, your travels to Arizona, I think it was that Texas, uh, Texas yeah. um, in the heat, you, you know, you're still having to deal with, with, you know, challenges and difficulties, but, um, you, you do it. Um, and you know, that's, that's amazing. And that I think it's good to hear other people's stories, uh, uh, in that respect. And I think that's a service your podcast is providing to our community. Great. Well, I, I do appreciate that. Thank you so much. And that's, that's why I do it. Uh, yeah, I just, when I was diagnosed, I couldn't find anything out about it. And I, and, and as people have heard me say before, I'm trying to find a reasonable voice for sarcoidosis. People, people will get online and they'll, they'll be angry. They'll be mad. They, you know, and, and so you hear, you hear the, you kind of see the worst version of people of, of, of that particular person, because it, it takes a lot to just get on there and then just have that rage just sort of come through on the keyboard. Um, and so I was seeing a lot of stuff that I thought, man, this is, this is really concerning me. I, I, I need to get out there and kind of, you know, play the journalist role a little bit um, and, and just get real stories and, 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 and have people listen and hear the whole person, you know? Um, so you get it, get it in context. And I think that's important. And it takes, you know, it takes a, a long interview to do that, in my opinion. Um, not just one comment, not just one soundbite, which TV news is often criticized for, rightly so in many cases. So that's that's kind of why I started the podcast. And it's very gratifying to hear that it's helped people, um, you know, and I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, so, Andy, but, you know, you have a uh, very interesting job, and I want to deviate just a little bit from the sarcoidosis discussion so people know who they're listening to. You're one of the guys who's out there looking at unmanned aircraft and and what the rules are and what the regulations are and what the success or failure is uh, of of drones flying around and uh, I, I do I do I dare say airplanes flying around without a pilot what what is it that you're looking at when you talk about autonomous aircraft well first of all my my area of expertise is is autonomous vehicles and, and unmanned uh, unmanned uh, aircraft, aircraft. Okay. Um, got it 
Uh, a lot of people call them drones. Um, and I've been involved in this space for almost 25 years. And the key is that I've come at it from a, a safety standpoint. Um, my role is to figure out how this technology works and how we can enable this technology to be utilized in a safe manner. Uh, I often describe my role as being kind of at the intersection between technology, policy, and operations. And I kind of deal a little bit with all, all of those uh, aspects. I've been involved in writing the regulations for enabling unmanned aircraft to operate. I've been involved with uh, research into the technology and also what it means operationally for, for the humans. You know, just because the aircraft's unmanned, it doesn't mean there's no humans involved and how the humans right. would be involved. And so I do, um, I do write papers. I do speak at conferences. In fact, I had to, when I had my pacemaker installed, I had to, um, you know, call and say, to you know, they it was pretty much an emergency uh, 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 installation of the the pacemaker. Uh, I had to cancel a, a trip to a conference where mm -hmm. I was speaking on several panels. I was moderating a panel, um, and I had to um, you know, cancel all of my participation. I had to, in 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 some instances, I found people to substitute for me, etc. And so my condition has impacted my work in that manner. I've had to, you know, alter uh, certain things. So, so, so that trip was canceled. When I canceled the trip, people say, why are you canceling trip? Well, I have to have a, a medical procedure and, you know, I have to explain. And when you have to say, oh, well, well I have sarcoidosis. No one knows what that is, you know? And um, so hmm. I usually just leave it as, you know, I'm, I'm having our heart issues because it's just too long an explanation. Right. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, for those that I am uh, sharing my my situation with. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it does impact. But what's ironic to me, and this is where I'm intellectually curious, where my two worlds come together, is software assurance. You know, uh, autonomous aircraft software is all it, it's all about the software. And software assurance is a critical part of what I deal with on a regular basis. You know, I've helped write standards related to software assurance. I've helped do software assurance research. Well, now I have a device inside me where my life is literally dependent on software. Right. Because it, it is keeping and, and functioning you know, inside me. And so the, you know, the world of aviation and the world of healthcare often intersect in terms of how we treat uh, the reliability of, of systems and products that are life critical. You know, software assurance for the medical field often followed the software assurance practices of the aviation field. And even some of the ways we, we treat aviation safety and processes are being copied by, by the medical field and vice versa. And so my two worlds came together. And so, hmm. you know, in, in some of my, you know, I, I am now literally um, uh, dependent on, on an autonomous system that is functioning inside me. Um, and, um, you know, that, that irony hasn't been lost on me in that I am now looking toward, you know, a uh, much more complex uh, environment uh, of an operation of a vehicle in the airspace, how that could be done safely as well. You know, that, the, that, the, yeah. the ICD pacemaker inside me is simplistic compared to the flight of an aircraft. Oh, I, I would think so. I guess I guess I would think so. I mean, that that device inside you has to detect if there is a problem with your heart and then it has to react in a certain way. And it is basically a trigger. So it's on or off, I would assume. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's uh, bounded. Right? Its behavior is bounded. Um, okay. You know, bounded. It, that's you know, that's that's a data term. Bounded. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, it could only do. You know, it could only do. It could fire or not fire. Right. It can uh, fire the ICD or not. You know. Right. And hopefully, it doesn't fire the the the, the defibrillator because um, my understanding is that's not pleasant. Um, 
No, that's I've heard that from many people with cardiac sarc that when that defibrillator goes off, you you will write that you you will remember that day forever. Um, yeah, I, I've talked talked to yeah. um, actually a a um, friend of uh, my son in law's um, who has uh, a defibrillator inside him, and I heard his experience of when it's gone off. So. Yeah, wow. So, but I got to ask you a drone question because you and I sure. before we started recording. Um, uh, and I, I live, uh, just outside of Blacksburg where Virginia tech is, and they've got a big center there where they're researching drones. And you and I have, have a, uh, person that we know in common named Tombo Jones. I interviewed him for a story on drones, I guess a couple of years ago now. Um, uh, but he was saying back then that the technology is now there. If we wanted to start flying people around where a drone could come to something like a bus stop and people would get on the drone and then fly to a bus stop downtown and get off and walk to work. The technology is already there to do that. Is that correct? I mean, do you agree that uh, let's take safety out of it for a minute. If it's just purely technology, that technology already exists. The, the technology to do it exists. The technology yeah. to do it in a demonstrably safe way that is within an acceptable level of risk, that's what we are still working on. Right. We have to be able to not only know that the technology works, but that the technology won't fail in an unacceptable way. And that's the, the challenge. And the other challenge is, um, uh, you know, and I like to make analogies. When you're driving on the road, creating a car to drive on the road, that's that technology exists. Mm -hmm. Creating a car that could drive on the road with other people that are driving on the road or a road that could include animals coming across or children coming across or pedestrians coming across the road. It's the integration with the environment that is not a controlled environment is a challenge. So the, the technology to enable an automatic or, or highly autonomous type of operation exists it's the um the ability to do it reliably in a complex world is mm -hmm. what we're still uh, refining and be able to demonstrate that reliability as well and so you know in some environments like a military environment the technology is being used today uh, in a highly autonomous flight but that, you know, the risk, the acceptance of risk in a military application is different than the acceptance of risk in a civil ap application. And so you and I, when we get on an airplane, we have an expectation of safety that, you know, has to be met, yep. which is different than the military expectation. Understandable. Yep. Understandable. Um well, you know, I've I've uh, I've also done a story on self-driving cars because that's a big thing. Again, going back to Virginia Tech and and making the car go. Uh, and I've assumed this is true for for flying vehicles of various descriptions as well. Uh, making the car go, making the car stop, making the car stay in its lane, that type of thing. That's relatively easy. It's when the car or the system the automatic system has to choose between two bad options that it becomes a problem. So uh, a bad actor uh, walks out in front of the car. Does the car then know to swerve? But if it swerves, it's going to hit a phone pole or it's going to come into oncoming traffic. So do you hit the pedestrian or, or do you swerve into oncoming traffic? And it, no one knows ethically what's the correct decision. And no one knows how to program the car on what decision to make. Right. Well, that that's a problem that people often talk about. Uh, it's a, what you just described is a variation of what they call the trolley problem, um, which came. Okay. Uh, um, actually, there's a, a a TV show that uh, uh, illustrated this wheel real well called the um, the Good Place. I think it was. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But the trolley. I remember problem the show, was, but I never I never watched it. But go ahead. Yep. It was. There was a. You know. You. You. A trolley's going down the tracks. And if it keeps going down the tracks, it's going to kill five people. But if you flip the switch, you can put it on a different track and it will just kill one person. Mm -hmm. Do you leave it on the track it's going on and do nothing and five people die? Or do you flip the switch and kill one person? But now you're making the decision to kill one person. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the trolley problem. 
And what you just described was a variation on the trolley problem. But that really isn't what I think the, the holdup is, is, is the holdup is dealing with the complex environment of the unexpected and, and the variances uh, on the unexpected is really where the challenge is. And so yeah. there's a hundred different ways people step off the, the, the curb into a crosswalk. Um, there's a thousand different ways. There's 10,000 different ways. You know, when you get into the details, um, the variance is so high. I was just reading uh, accident reports of uh, a self-driving car in San Francisco that in the space of two weeks hit two different pedestrians in, cro in crosswalks, um, including running over one of those pedestrians. And so these are accidents that, um, you know, would a human driver have made the same mistake? Probably we'll see these systems are, are, and we're observing them, they're failing differently than how people fail. And mm -hmm. so the, the, the things that you would fail at as a driver is not the things that a, a self-driving car would fail out. And the same thing with a self-flying aircraft or self-piloting aircraft, the things that will fail out will be different than a, the things that person fails at. And so these are the things I get to deal with uh, on a regular basis. I've, I've watched the technology grow I've, I've helped actually create some of the faa regulations that that govern drone technology today and um you know i'm i'm glad to be part of the cutting edge uh, of the future technology uh, i work with with very exciting technology and i work with a very exciting community uh dealing with these issues and uh you know i think you know assuming sarcoidosis is uh uh, not going to affect our lifespans. I think in your and my lifetime, we will see self-flying aircraft that are going to be available for us to to board. Now, whether we can afford that ticket or not, that, <laughs> mm, interesting. Um, but uh, they will be there. So. The market will have to decide that, I guess. Right. Um, so let's go, let's get back to you because you started out by saying you and your wife uh, compare heart rates when you're cycling, uh, which is actually something my wife and I do, um, not at every intersection, but, you know, after we climb a big hill or whatever, uh, you know, how high did your heart rate get? Da, 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 da. And it's, it's mostly uh, a little competitive thing. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I'm just curious, are you able still to work out the way that you like to do, whether it's on your bike or running or working out at the gym? Um, are you uh, still I, able I to do that? I, I am. Um, I was told to um, limit exertion at one point, um, and I actually bought an e-bike um, to uh, limit my exertion, but still be able to participate. Mm -hmm. um, we late in life discovered the joy of bicycle touring, um, and so we we started taking bicycle touring trips, mm -hmm. and um, we had a bicycle touring trip planned, and the. Uh, uh, the, my cardiologist, I have three different cardiologists, um, but they all basically uh, said, you know, you really shouldn't be exerting right now until we know what's going on. And um, I said, how about an e-bike? And um, they said, yeah. And I monitored my heart rate and I didn't let it exceed a certain amount. And I was able to participate in the bicycle tour on an e-bike. Um, and the, the joke was, you know, are you on Andy power now or are you, cause you always have to be pedaling on. So others can't tell whether you're getting the boost or not, you know, right, people like, right. like, Oh, this is all Andy power. Um, no, I'm using the boost. Um, and, uh, but, uh, and I, I participated uh, on that tour uh, with, with no real one minor incident where I had um, a fit, a fit during, during the ride. And I had to wait for it to dissipate. So. Okay. All and right. this was before the pacemaker. Where were you touring? Um, we did something called the Katy Trail in Missouri. Okay. It's uh, about a 250 mile, I, I forget exactly, uh, uh, rails to trail, gravel uh, bike path that runs from, from uh, I forget where it starts, um, and all the way into St. Louis. And we, we had all our stuff with us and stopped at different uh, bed and breakfasts or small hotels along the way. And had a had a grand time so oh that's awesome i'm gonna put oh. that i'm gonna i'm writing down katie trail as something for me to look at and well and so much our our next target 
is the uh, Cumberland um, uh, Allegheny uh, Passage uh, right here, which is much closer. It's right here in, uh, in you know, uh, it, it starts in Pennsylvania or it goes into uh, Maryland, uh, much closer to where you are. Right. And uh, that that ride is our next, that's our next tour for next summer. So, next summer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we, we did, we also did one last summer. We were in Maine. Uh, we did our, our bike tour in Maine. So, Beautiful. And, and I did that on a, uh, on a regular, um, some people are using the, the term uh, acoustic bike, um, as a verse is an electric bike, uh -huh. an acoustic bike, electric guitar, acoustic guitar. Oh, I've heard okay, this term, okay. Acoustic Got bike. It. Acoustic um, bike. Um, and, uh, so, uh, I was, I, I, it was all Andy power on that trip. Nice. Good for you. Uh -huh. Good for you. Well, maybe we can get together and ride bicycles someday. Oh, I'd love it. So. Yeah, that would be that'd be awesome. Well, Andy, look, anything else you want to add before we close? No, I just I, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing, and uh, I appreciate it. I look forward to uh, you know hearing interviews you do with with other uh, Sark fighters who are patients and the the medical professionals who are also uh, doing the research that is going to hopefully find better treatments and who knows, you know even a cure one day would be would be fabulous but. that really would be all right andy thank you so much hey thank you i enjoyed it i feel like a zombie just feeding that stumbling thanks again to andy for sharing his story and hopefully maybe someday we can all ride our bikes together raise some money for sarcoidosis and as to his work with uh, unmanned autonomous i guess that's redundant autonomous flying vehicles maybe andy will be the guy that we don't get in our car and go to the mall we all just uh, call for an uber drone and it comes and picks us up at our house wouldn't that be cool the official Sark Fighter song called Zombie is by Mark Steyer and his band, the White Hot Lizards from Alberta, Canada. Mark's story, the story behind his lyrics, because he's a fellow Sark Fighter, is back in episode 12. God, I can't believe that. The Sark Fighter podcast comes out every other Monday, as I mentioned just a while ago. My trusty boxer, Dougal, is curled up on the chair in my office. He doesn't even look up when I say his name anymore, but he still makes my life so much better. The backstory to the founding for the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research, and you should listen to that interview, is episode 11 with Andrea and Redding Wilson. Don't forget to follow me on social media. Just search for Sark Fighter on Facebook, Instagram. I'm even on Peloton as Sark Fighter. If you have a Peloton treadmill uh, or uh, bike in your house, my cycling blog is called Carl and the Cyclist, and there is a section there called Cycling with Sarcoidosis. If you are new and just trying to figure out what sarcoidosis is, just go back and listen to episode two with Dr. Simon Hart of the UK. My story is episode one. Please send me an email, as Andy did. It's very easy to reach me. It's in the show notes, carlinagency at gmail.com. Happy Thanksgiving, and until next time, Keep fighting.